Good evening. The regular meeting of the Brisbane Planning Commission of Tuesday, April 24, 2018 will now come to order. Could we please have a roll call? Commissioner Gomez? Here. Commissioner Gooding? Here. Commissioner Mackin? Here. Commissioner Patel? Here. Commissioner Siason? Here. The record will show all commissioners are present. Could we have a motion to adopt the agenda, please? I'll move to adopt the agenda. Second, please. I'll second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. None opposed. The motion passes. Next item, we have the consent calendar. Is there anyone that wishes to address the commission on any item that does not appear on tonight's agenda? Seeing no one responding, we move on. Could we have a motion to adopt the consent calendar, please? I make a motion to adopt the consent calendar. And a second, please. I'll second. All in favor? Aye. 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 None opposed? Motion carries. Oral communications. Uh, do we have anyone who wishes to address the, I see one person came in to address the commission? No? Okay. Written communications, we have one item, came from the Housing Leadership Council, and this is regarding an event on Friday, May 18th, an annual policy breakfast and kickoff event. Uh, that's our written communications. Tonight we have a public hearing on use permit UP 9-17 at 273 A Valley Drive. That's TC1 Crocker Park Trade Commercial District. And before we commence, I'd just like to ha have a moment to make a request for all of the commissioners. Could we please make requests to be recognized through the chair? And the reason is rather than speaking directly to the applicants or members of the public, it is a public hearing, each commissioner will be called upon to ask questions. And if we could be mindful of time, enable each commissioner to have their fair share and also just a reminder that our discussions take place after the public hearing is closed and that's during our deliberations. Thank you. Could we have a staff report, please? Yes, good evening, Commission. So the use permit application before you tonight is for a cannabis retail delivery, warehousing, and light manufacturing business intended to occupy approximately 6,000 square feet in an existing and occupied um, warehouse and office building in the TC1 district at 275 Valley Drive. Um, per the TC1 Crocker Park district regulations, a use permit is required for any cannabis related business um, that's permitted in our code. So just to orient you to the location, again, this is just down the street at uh, 275 Valley Drive. Um, adjacent uses are all occupied in existing um, warehouse, office, some retail uses, as well as the uh, Crocker Park and uh, Recreational Trail that runs along the back end um, to the east of the subject property. So here's the uh, site plan provided by the applicant. So this shows uh, not only existing parking on the site, but the existing loading dock area located on the east side of the building, uh, intended to be utilized by the applicant. And the um, eastern driveway as well would be the primary access point for um, any vehicles related to the proposed use in terms of trucks for offloading and loading. Um, there's a, a little over 100 parking spaces currently on the site. Um, there's no change in uh, use at this point for the structure, so there's no analysis related to parking demand requirements. It's just not triggered by the proposed use. So I think we'll maybe have a little bit of a, a higher level refresher on what the current status of cannabis regulation is at the state level as well as local level. So as you guys probably all recall, in 2016, California voters by initiative adopted um, the Medicinal and Adult Use Cannabis Regulation and Safety Act. 
um, basically legalizing the adult use of cannabis, um, as well as the commercial sale, production, cultivation, et cetera, of cannabis for um, adult use, as well as uh, changing the existing regulations we had related to medicinal cannabis. So this instituted a huge new uh, bureaucracy at the state level in terms of um, you know, creating a licensing structure, delegating to which specific departments of the state government would uh, regulate which different types of businesses and licenses. Um, a really important point for us tonight um, is to emphasize that regardless of the state licensing process, the state always needs affirmative approval from the local jurisdiction before granting any state license. So the state will not give a business a license unless the city says, whichever city it's in says, yes, it is compliant with whatever land use regulations we have. And then here at the local level in Brisbane, um, not all of you were on the commission when this was done, but um, as you recall, the city did go through about a uh, six month process at commission and city council to um, develop regulations, zoning regulations to allow certain types of cannabis related businesses in town um, in one district, as it turns out, the TC1 district. Uh, those uses are um, warehousing, distribution, retail, delivery only, no storefront, um, as well as uh, light manufacturing. Um, we also do allow research and development in certain other districts too. So um, the, perf the zoning ordinance that was adopted contains um, not only the requirement for cannabis businesses to obtain a use permit prior to operating, but also several performance standards that a business would need to demonstrate compliance with in order to get permits, and as well as continue to operate under those standards for however long they're operating. So that brings us to tonight. Uh, the applicant has already started that first step, applying for this use permit. Um, in terms of reviewing a use permit, there are uh, certain findings that the commission has to make affirmatively. Um, one of the uh, portions of the first finding is that the proposed use is um, uh, compliant with and consistent with adjacent uses and structures. So in this particular instance, um, again, all the adjacent properties are occupied by existing and occupied warehouse, office, retail, distribution uses, um, not, you know, as is characteristic of the entire Crocker Park District. And in addition to that, the existing building itself, again, is already occupied by the primary tenant of the building, which it's about a 70,000 square foot warehouse um, that's been occupied for years by integrated resource group. So this proposed use would be kind of uh, accessory to that existing space. So it would be in a mezzanine level within that building. Um, when it comes to um, considering again adjacent uses, you know, as I mentioned, the Crocker, uh, Crocker Park Recreational Trail does um, just go around the back of this property and along the side. I think that probably uh, influenced the uh, police department's conditions of approval that you saw in the resolution um, in, in the conditions of approval section related to security at the uh, loading dock area and exterior building entrance. Um, and I just do want to note that uh, the plan or police department is essentially retaining the right to impose whatever conditions they feel are necessary for security at the time of building permit. So you'll see in the operations plan submitted by the applicant references to security measures, um, many of which were crafted with input from the police, but police does retain that right to basically determine at building permit what um, improvements are really necessary for safety. Um, so moving on to the next uh, component of the findings of approval related to whether the use is consistent with the general plan. So again, the general plan designation for this property is trade commercial, which is a land use category that allows a mix of commercial uses, including warehousing, um, light industrial, retail, all of which are um, with the proposed use fits into that mix of commercial uses. Um, and given the uh, proposed operations plan as well as submitted site plan, um, the application is consistent with the applicable general plan policies, not only to 
um, economic development and general kind of um, supporting new businesses, but also Crocker Park sub-area policies that really in the general plan speak more to, again, performance standard related um, requirements such as requiring all aspects of a business to take place inside the building and that sort of thing, really related to maintaining that um, garden business park aesthetic that is important to the Crocker Park um, sub area. And the last finding um, is that the proposed use would not be detrimental to the health, safety, comfort, and general wel welfare or injurious or detrimental to property and improvements. Um, so again, this is kind of covered in the previous discussion, um, but the proposed use would be compatible with existing use on the property as well as in the immediate vicinity. Um, in addition, the operations plan was tailored to incorporate all the performance standards that um, are required in the zoning ordinance. Those performance standards are also required in our conditions of approval and reiterated there that again, should you grant this use permit, they would be uh, required to comply with those at all times. Um, and again, that uh, site and building security would be uh, specific improvements would be subject to police department approval at building permit. Uh, so with that, staff is recommending conditional approval of the project uh, by adoption of the draft resolution subject to the findings and conditions of approval therein. So at this point, I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you. Commissioner Sison, you want to start us off with questions? Um, I don't have any questions of staff, but um, I do have the applicant, so I'll just... How about we just hold yeah. that then? Commissioner uh, Patel, let's move down to you. Uh, no, I have no questions. Commissioner Gooding? No, likewise, I have a couple questions of the applicant, but okay. not, a, not a... Commissioner staff. Gomez? Uh, none for staff. No okay, problem. I have two for staff. Uh, first of all, if we could refer to staff report on hours of operation, alluding to City Council directing the Commission to consider amending the permitted operating hours. Could you just give us a little idea w what transpired there? Sure. So at the um, April 5th, 19th, mm -hmm. at the meeting uh, last month or earlier this month where council adopted the um, eliminating the prohibition on the uh, schools and daycares, the locational provision they eliminated, they indicated in their discussion that they wanted us to consider modifications to the cannabis ordinance related to hours of operation because they noticed that you know stopping operations at seven might not really fit with a business model of a retail delivery only business that might want to do deliveries later than that um, but I think that's something that the director might follow up with you separately about because council maybe wanted us to revisit those regulations in greater depth at another time but that was one of the things that they highlighted. And, and if you could explain by what mechanism the Planning Commission would consider that and implement that. There would be a separate zoning code amendment filed or, or initiated by the council. Um, the council also made some reference to looking at other um, aspects of the cannabis regulations. So before we came back with a sort of a focused uh, amendment related only to um, hours of operation. We wanted to understand from the council what exactly their scope of interest or concern was so, so we could provide a more full picture to the commission and handle this in one amendment as opposed to, you know, these periodic or serial amendments of one item at a time. So, so there'll be some conversation with staff and the, there's a subcommittee of the council who will be providing some further input that'll all be reflected in the code amendment that comes before you, uh, you know, when, when we get scheduled maybe later this summer. Okay, thank you. Second question I have is regarding the conditions of approval and I'm on page G 1.48 mentions under prior to issuance of a building permit. Number two, Continuous corridor to the exterior of the second floor stair shall be provided subject to final approval by the building official to ensure exiting does not discharge into the ground floor tenant space not controlled by Cannabox. Could you elaborate a little bit on that because I found that a little bit vague. Sure, so that's a 
very specific floor plan requirement that the building official um, decided to impose upon them as a condition in this use permit. Um, I think if you're curious exactly why, I, I would imagine that he wants to control exiting to make sure that these secure areas or, you know, the security measures that Cannabox is required to implement, you know, to make sure that unauthorized persons are not somehow accessing, you know, Cannabox from the portion of the building that's not controlled by them. So I think the intent of that is that the building official wants a dedicated exiting plan related to the security of the space. And so is that referencing an exit or also a primary entrance? I guess that's part of my question because un until I got more into the report, I realized- I think, yeah, I'd probably be both. Okay. And, and I'll just acknowledge that we did not provide floor plans. Right. And that's, I mean, for security- I um, understood. And I don't know if but, yeah. this maybe should also wait for the applicant, but- it, it was also not clear if the occupancy is on the second floor, whether the loading dock has to be accessed from the first floor or if that's accessible from the second floor. So the loading dock is, has to, from the loading dock, you need to enter through a door to get into the building and then you would have to go upstairs to get to the tenant space. So I think again, the intent being that there is a secured exiting, I guess, and entering, but I think exiting is a very building code specific term talking about, you know, in case of emergency, there has to be an exit path. And um, and do we know, and again, I, I'll be happy to reserve this to the applicant, how the product is actually transported to the loading dock? Um, I believe the operations plan does detail at least how that procedure, but if you're curious about like if it's in boxes or whatever, I think, yeah, that might be directed towards the app. Okay, thank you very much. Commissioner Gooding? Yeah, I, I thought of this. Um, and I, I'm not sure if you folks have, have this level of detail, but what, what remaining decisional or discretional power is there for the police department to, to revisit issues here? What, I'm not, I wasn't clear exactly what they reserve or what they uh, can continue to do? Uh, well, I guess maybe I should clarify. So what I meant in my report by the fact that they reserve the right to, I was referencing more the fact that you don't see specifically in your conditions of approval all of the security improvements that police may end up imposing That's prior to granting the building going, permit. Yeah. yeah. And so what what can they do and, and what? They can do anything that they feel is required to make sure the space is secure. Hmm. So the code does require a security plan, which is included in the operations plan that the applicant created. And again, the applicant went through a couple rounds during our normal completeness review with police to make sure that what's written and was submitted for you guys and attached to the report does comply with what the police department would be asking of them at permit. Um, I just wanted to make sure it was understood that again, police can require whatever they feel is necessary. Right, and that's my, that's my concern is that, that it's a bit, that that might be indefinite or, or inexact or vague is, I mean, when can, I'm not sure I'm comfortable with the police having a continuing right to keep on requiring more and keep sort of moving the target on the applicant without some, some definite target for them to hit. And, and you know, where is that laid out? That's a, a valid point. Um, the code is structured such that it says, you know, it's really at the police department's discretion. Um, I just would point out that, again, the police chief is um, works for the city manager, so they don't have unfettered discretion, again, like any other a aspect of the municipal code. It's ultimately subject to interpretation by the city council at the end of the day. If, if an applicant felt the, the staff was not being, was being overly um, arbitrary in how they're implementing code, 
provisions such as the requirement for the security plan there are venues for the applicant to to move through a sort of a, a process through the city manager and ultimately to the council to to address those issues it doesn't go into the the police department doesn't have i guess complete unfettered sort of discretion over this particular um decision yeah obviously I mean, the, i'm sure i'm the sure council, they have the council would rely heavily on their judgment but ultimately uh, they don't have unfettered control okay any other commissioners like to ask a question no okay at this point we'll open the public hearing and if there's any members of the public who would wish to address the commission there's some slips to fill out in the lobby if you could please fill them out as a request <laughs> and hand them to staff and otherwise um, I think the applicant is here if someone would like to step forward identify yourself and address the Commission For the record, could you state your name, please, and who you represent? Hi. Um, thank you for seeing us today. My name is Michelle Dizitzer, and uh, this is my husband and partner. Hi. I'm Randy Dizitzer. And uh, thank you for being here, um, and I'm representing Cannabox, the founder of Cannabox. Um, I have a sample box here, um, if it's okay if I can pass it to you. Um, I'll quickly just explain what we have in here. Um, sorry, it's a little fresh. Um, so here we have just an example of what uh, Cannabox is. Um, what you'll see in here is an explanation card and a few products um, of samples, so different small versions of different products, and we'll go through and kind of and explain, but it's basically different little products that can be helped in different ways, different application process. And we'll kind of walk you through them as we go along. So I'll just pass this along. Thanks. And we have a, um, a great team here. If there's questions that we're not able to answer, we have people here who can really help us. Um, okay, so what is Cannabox? And then I guess I use this thing. Um, Cannabox is a company that is meant to help people figure out what cannabis is for them. So think Birchbox, Stitch Fix, Ipsy, but for cannabis. So you get a subscription box and it helps you try different samples and figure out what would work best for you. So the cannabis industry is growing faster than it's able to standardize. It's confusing for consumers to learn, navigate, and manage. And it's a challenge for brands to educate and share information. So our goal is to really be able to help people understand what cannabis is and be able to feel comfortable with it. Cannabis is an extremely new concept to a lot of people and they're very uncomfortable with it or they don't know how to use it properly. So they go into dispensaries possibly and they're not sure what to get or they talk to people and people give recommendations. But with the lack of research, recommendations are still just recommendations and there's not enough research to really understand what works best. The best way to really understand what works best is to try it ourselves in small doses and to really slowly understand what is going to work best for us. So this is our goal is to allow people to try different samples and to really figure out for themselves what cannabis means for them and for brands to really be able to share their products, tell their stories on a technology platform, and to educate people what their products are. So this is kind of what I was talking about. So cannabis in general is a very expensive um, product. It's a medicine, um, and now it's been uh, legalized recreationally. So when people go into a store or, or buy it through delivery, they're typically buying one or two, a few products. Um, they can be 
hundreds of dollars for one, uh, for a few products. And what if you buy that product and it doesn't work for you? One, you're intimidated to go back in or two, you don't want to try it. And now you have uncomfortability. You could be trying to solve a pain, a headache or anxiety. And now you're not really wanting to go and experience that again. Um, so there's many different options. There's many different consumption methods. There's tinctures and lotions and uh, flour and vape cartridges. Um, everyone reacts differently to many different types of consumption. So it's really difficult for people to fully understand what's going to work best for them. Also, everyone, re everyone reacts differently to different types of products. What, how I react to a certain product may be different than how Randy's going to react to different product. Even though I may recommend something for him, he may not have the same reaction. So when you go to a doctor's, you know how they start you off on a very small dose and slowly raise your limit based on what's going to be best for you. Well, cannabis should work similarly. So this is kind of a way for you to figure out what's going to be your right dose, what's going to be right, your right consumption method, what's going to be your right brand. And our goal is to educate consumers about what that is and what cannabis is in general. So that is kind of um, what we offer to consumers. To brands, we're really trying to teach people about quality and help smaller brands be able to access consumers. Advertising in the cannabis industry is very difficult and restricted. Um, it's not allowed online. Um, there's a lot of um, legalities around it. Um, it's There are billboards, but they're mostly for big technology companies. Smaller brands with high quality aren't able to reach consumers. So our goal is to try to help some of the smaller brands who have high quality reach consumers. Um, in stores, you'll see a few brands, but there's limited shelf space. There's many other companies out there that could be a right fit for consumers, but don't have access to those consumers. So this allows people to really have a wide variety of options. One, for consumers to reach those brands and brands to reach those consumers. Also, prior to January, sampling was allowed. So you can go to a dispensary and talk to brands hand in hand, talk to the people who were actually providing that product, talk to them about what they put in their product, and try a little bit to see how you react. Now that's not allowed anymore. So it really creates a barrier for people to really understand how they're going to react with the process. So in summary, Cannabox is a socially responsible platform to help discover a variety of cannabis products through a sample subscription box. Valuable data is identified on the individual and market to promote research and personalization. Our boxes are catered per person. Our goal is to not just send out general samples, but really to help people I um, to really help people individualize their personal experience. Um, we are a social entrepreneurship company. This is my personal passion and where we really wanted to take Cannabox. We want to have the program of buy a box, give a box. The idea of cannabis in general started on um, a compassion program. It was a medicine. It is a medicine. Um, you know, the idea of recreation exists, but really... Um, it's still a medicine, whether it's used recreationally or not. There's a lot of people who understand this and a lot of people who still use it recreationally, but we all have endocannabinoid systems in our bodies. And if we use it properly and understand how it's used and how it's put together, we can really find a way to use it um, medically as well. So our goal is to help organizations that use it medically um, receive the medicine they need um, in a way that uh, is affordable to them. So we really want to help the organizations like veterans and uh, research for autism and uh, really help uh, organizations receive the medicine they need and teach people about the compassion aspects of cannabis. So when they purchase a box, we're going to really try to match that and help other con um, uh, other foundations uh, receive the medicine that they're looking for. Um, I kind of spoke about this, but um, variety, sample sized, uh, curated, and education. It's kind of the topics that we really want to be able to push, helping people figure out what they like through sample sizes. And once they figure it out, they can put what they like on a subscription so they get it every month, or they can um, get a delivery to their home. Um, so either on a on-demand or on a regular subscription monthly. 
and why we chose Brisbane. We are um, born and raised um, Bay Area members, um, both of us. Um, I've lived in South San Francisco and San Francisco my whole life. I've loved Brisbane um, my whole life. I We want to move here. We have two children. Um, we have been through this process with Brisbane uh, for uh, the entire time. Uh, Brisbane currently passed their ordinances, 617 and 625. So we're very excited to hopefully be able to go through with Brisbane through this process. Um, on May 5th, hopefully Brisbane will allow uh, cannabis businesses to start operating, and we really hope to be part of this. Um, the industrial zone is a great area for cannabis businesses to operate. It's um, not really accessible to a lot of public. Our location is great because it's on the second floor. It's not accessible to public, and it's safer because it's on the second floor um, it's close to a lot of freeways so it is accessible to a lot of people and we can provide a lot of deliveries to people who need medicine um, we really want to be a asset to the community that's kind of what our business is about it's, it's a lot a big piece of who we are about we want to be a value to Brisbane as well and we want to help smaller businesses reach um, consumers. We want to help these brands be able to really tell their stories and have consumers be able to understand who these brands are, not only cannabis in general, but what actually works best for them and be a go-to-market strategy and channel for them. And I'm going to let Randy kind of take over from here. Um, so, um, as Julia mentioned in her presentation to the council, uh, to operate a lawful cannabis business in California, uh, uh, the business requires both a city permit uh, as well as a state license. Um, and the state li the state uh, rules do not do not supersede this the local jurisdictions rules. So, the local jurisdictions rules and ordinances take precedence. Um, in terms of uh, licensing authorities, uh, the Bureau of Cannabis Control. Um, is the uh, is the uh, governing body that uh, that uh, monitors retail and distribution uh, businesses, um, and the California Department of Public Health uh, is the governing body that manufactures any kind of uh, that oversees any uh, manufacturing businesses. Um, some of the activities um, that that we are looking for um, are non storefront retail. Um, which would be kind of uh, the delivery of retail products uh, to uh, patients and consumers. Uh, distribution, which would include uh, warehousing of products as well as uh, delivering of those products to other licensed businesses throughout California, as well as uh, some potential uh, light manufacturing, uh, for example, uh, extractions using mechanical methods uh, or other non-volatile solvents, uh, packaging, of cannabis products is considered manufacturing um, and other cannabis product uh, manufacturing, for example, creating topicals, infused edibles, etc. Um, just a little bit uh, double clicking on kind of what manufacturing is. Uh, manufacturing is defined at a high level as the compounding or preparation of cannabis by different extraction methods um, and also it includes packaging. Packaging is one of the activities that falls under manufacturing. Uh, as you kind of see in the box, uh, manufactured products can be anything from topicals to distillates, uh, edibles, uh, etc. And one of the reasons why we're doing uh, this this business is because more products are being developed each day, and it's a great way for kind of consumers to learn about the different products that are out there to figure out uh, what is best for them. Um, the different manufacturing methods also impact the way. Uh, the medicine is, interacts with our bodies, so different uh, consumption methods or different manufacturing methods could produce slow releases for, for a sustained effect, uh, short durations for intense applications, or long, uh, long duration through a sustained release. Um, Cannabox will either be receiving uh, ready-made products or manufacturing some products uh, on site, uh, giving smaller brands opportunity to be discovered, and of course providing education throughout the process through uh, the materials in the box, as well as our platform for the responsible usage uh, and safe usage of these products. We're also a technology company. Sure. <laughs> and we're also a technology company. Um, I'll stop here um, at the appendix. We have a few more slides that talk about some of the questions I heard uh, that the council um, had asked during their questions to staff. Um, Why don't you go ahead with the presentation and that way sure. we'll know what questions okay. to ask. Of Thank course. you. <laughs> of course. Um, so, on this slide, we see a flow of product in and out of the facility. On the top, we see the ground floor. On the bottom, we see the second floor. So, as you see on the ground floor, on the right-hand side, products originate from the loading dock 
enter through the through the double doors, um, up the stairs through our facility, um, and into any of those rooms right there on the second floor. And there is a procedure for the way we receive product. Um, there's ex in general when with cannabis products, there's an extreme security measures. Whether where you have someone, there's a <coughs> bunch of cameras, and there's someone watching the door. You have to ping them. They have to ch tell you that it's okay to come out and then someone come I mean there's um, a lot of process that goes into receiving and receiving and receiving product and um, uh, distributing product so when you asked if there is procedures in um, exiting and uh, receiving product there's many many processes that go into that there's only one entrance and exit uh, for product, except there's also an emergency exit on the other side. That emergency exit is not to be entered um, into. It is purely there for an emergency exit um, on the other side, which is now showing on uh, the, the red line. on the, the red lines. So um, it's on the other side of the second floor. So there is an exit on the other side, but it's not to be used. There's sirens and s signs and... <laughs> A whole bunch of uh, alarm systems that would go off if that would be entered into. And, and also, just to add um, something that is in the operations plan, but just to reiterate, the state of California requires what they call a track and trace system. Anytime cannabis products exchange hands from one licensee or to a consumer, it has to be logged in the track and trace system. The track and trace system is subject to um, uh, audits. Um, and any kind of product loss has to be reported to uh, all necessary authorities, and you guys can find more information um, in our operations plan about that as well. Um, and the last slide, the last slide also um, just talks about potential future flow of product um, under the full utilization of the facility, uh, where we see uh, all of the suites uh, being used um, for for some kind of uh, cannabis-related activity. Not um, currently. This is for future expansion. Do you want to, would you like to show the security gate option? I think okay. it's, this is okay. Okay. We'll end our presentation here. And okay, if you could stick around because sure. I think we're going to have some questions. Sure. So how about Commissioner Gomez? Would you like to start? Yeah. yeah. Thank you for the presentation. <clears throat> I actually had a couple of questions. Number one uh, would be, are you currently operating your business in Brisbane in a smaller location or the, okay because this no. would be the first of its kind so you're in another city right now at a smaller scale we were um, so we've been building this business for two years okay um, we had a non store we had a NBC which is a mutual benefit corporation um, in San Francisco okay. in 2016 but we haven't been operating um, we had a few beta projects but it's been mostly building technology and building out our relationships and working with the state and cities Okay. Okay. So, so your so your startup. Yes. Correct. Essentially. Okay. And and this uh, this courier service that you would be operating that's a a private contractor or is that employees? No, that would of... be us. Delivery drivers have to be W two employees. Okay. Okay. All right. Um, that's all I have at this moment. I'm sure other questions that'll come up sure. will stimulate others. Sure. I'll, we'll I'll, circle I'll... back to okay. everybody. Commissioner Patel. Just. Just because I'm curious. Sure, absolutely. Um, is it this is non-cash transactions? Is it all digital via apps or something like that, where you guys keep track of what people are buying, what they like? Um, on the technology platform, we are tracking everything through um, algorithm, and um, or we have a technology platform, so everything online is going to be through a subscription service. Um, banking is a big topic in the cannabis industry. Um, our goal is to be um, as non-cash touching as possible um through consumers everything is going to be no, um non-cash touching and may i just say if anyone of my team wants to jump in at any point please come up and add if you have anything so i've looked through these products it looks like these are some of the products that you were talking about in terms of small businesses that are sort yeah. of making products and you would be marketing them and giving them or selling them to customers via Cannabox. Sure. This is great. Thank Good you. Marketing stuff. Appreciate it. You're welcome. Um, I was um, wanted to talk to you a little bit about the extractions and the cannabis um, 
product manufacturing. I do understand what you talked you talked about in terms of packaging as manufacturing. What type of other manufacturing would you guys be looking to expand into in terms of extraction? How viable is a mechanical extraction versus using volatile solvents in sure. terms of commerciability? Sure. I'm going to pull up my compliance team here. Sure. Um, but non-volatile is um, basically non-chemical. And yeah, I'm going to have them speak to that because sure. they're the experts. Thanks. Hello. Uh, my name is Kai. My name's Neil. Nice uh, to meet you. We have a company, Spanscape. We're both uh, compliance uh, specialists from Colorado. So we started back in 2009 there. Um, and Went uh, through a similar process. Worked with uh, the state to go through and build a lot of the early regulations um, and are familiar with uh, the metric system that's going to be put in place for the state here. Um, is for your question for manufacturing, um, for what we'd be doing to be non-volatile if they were to be doing uh, manufacturing in there uh, through expansion, uh, more likely than not, uh, things like a, what would be considered a rosin press, which is just uh, basically a big hydraulic press that smashes the product, um, getting the oils to come out, and then they uh, scrape the oils from that. Um, when so it comes to uh, viability. Excuse, excuse me, you've got to speak into the microphone because we've got some oh, yeah, people at home. When it, com when it comes to uh, viability, um, non-volatile extraction is becoming a little more popular because people are, are getting more and more afraid of what they're actually using to extract the products. And when they're talking about hexane and butane and other stuff like that, some people shy away from that. So um, there's definitely with the whole green kind of thing, uh, non-volatile is pretty popular and, you know, isn't very destructive or, you know. It's, it's and definitely commercially, uh, commercially viable systems at this point have been getting put in place for non-volatility. Um, you know, everything from small, medium to very large scale systems. Um, what we'd be doing at this facility would not be in the medium or larger scale volume, just uh, requiring the, the power and um, the facilities are usually more in, in industrial spaces. Um, but like I said, this would be um, more mechanical extraction, um, rosin presses, uh, potentially some uh, light uh, water hash extraction, uh, cold water, uh, things of those sorts. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Commissioner Sison? Yes, I just had one question. So um, you stated that you wanted to help other businesses come in and, and use your space. And um, I was just curious, so would they would be doing the, pretty much the same thing that, that you're doing? So our goal is to help. So it's really difficult for smaller manufacturers, similar to these. Um, these were lucky to get licensed, to get licenses. Um, and it's it, what's happening is is much bigger businesses are able to get licenses and some of the smaller brands are not able to make their way into um into the market and the state has allowed something um to do like a shared manufacturing so our goal is to help some of these brands make it to market through our canna box um so that they can showcase their product um because they're such high quality we don't want cannabis to be lost um um, some of the high quality products to be lost because they just can't get licensed and they don't have the funds to do so. So our goal is to be able to provide a space for them to possibly get um, licensed and um, to create some of their products in a light manufacturing process. Sorry. And if I could also add um, that the activities that we're outlining in uh, the CUP request as well as operation plans, their activities would have to be uh, equal to or less than those activities. Absolutely. Okay. So everything in terms of um, about the security measures, background checks, everything would apply to them as well. Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. And they still would have to get their own own business license if that if and when that would be the case and they would still have to get their own state license. Um it, it, this would not be under Cannabox. It would I mean it would be under the CUP but it would still be they would still have to have their own uh, company. Cannabox would just be a vehicle for them to be able to tell their story and get out to the public. That's it. Commissioner Gooding. Yeah, thank you. I have, I think, three questions. Um, your business model, I'm sort of curious as a, as a practical, you know, day in the life, how do you get delivery orders and how do you uh, – stage them and organize them and deliver them? Um, it's through our technology platform. So we're, uh, we call it plant touching technology company. Um, there's a lot of cannabis companies that are not plant touching. 
which means they don't have to get licensed, and we are plant touching, meaning that orders come in through, you'd sign up to our our company like Ipsy or Birchbox or Stitch Fix. So you'd go onto our platform and um, uh, we don't have it in this deck, but in our investment deck, we do have um, kind of examples. So you'd go and you'd do like a personality test kind of to start. Um, and based on that test, uh, we'd kind of curate your first box. And based on that first box, you would get your, you would, you would get your information and you'd put in your, your, uh, your your credit card or your um, your financial information, and then we would set a delivery date. Based on your delivery date, we would have to deliver that box directly to you. License, we'd have to check your license. It's very strict policy that our box have to go directly to your hand. There's no leaving it. There's no leaving it on your door. There's no shipping it. It's direct hand to hand. Um, and based on how you interact with the product, you would give us feedback on our platform um, and in, we would interact with you based on how you're reacting to the different products. And then your next month's box would be better curated based on how you're reacting. So you'd possibly get same products from the same brands or different products from different brands. And then if you like some products from the boxes or different products um, that you see on the platform, you could then order them directly. And say the delivery method would be the same way. And so on a day-to-day -day basis, you know, how assume you do nicely and you meet your, your target goals, whatever your internal goals are for, for growth, how many or vehicle trips would you anticipate per day leaving and coming to this facility? So it's it's a growing um, scale, so we're still figuring that out. But we can also partner with other dispense non-storefront delivery companies. So we can also send orders. We can process them, but we can also have other delivery companies that are licensed to do deliveries for us. So even though that we are processing it and it is our sale, we can have other delivery companies. If we are getting to a certain scale that we can't process, we can also partner with other delivery companies. So we have kind of plan A, plan B, plan C, plan D. Um, but it, it really, because the cannabis industry is changing and laws are still being made, it's still a work in process. Um, the whole industry is kind of still figuring out the delivery model. So we are kind of going with the flow. Are these like little, little 40 cono vans or... Um, each, or each car has or? to have security um, security process as its own. So you have to, I mean, um, maybe compliance team can speak to that, but the cars have to be, there's a security process for the cars as well, which are also in our operations plan. But they would know more detail about that as well. I just don't want to say something that is not completely accurate. So and to answer that, I think um, part of the thing, what, we, what we're trying to uh, look into as far as um, our projections is, doing a model based around estimations of hourly um, orders that would be coming in. Um, and it would be ideally vehicles as efficient as possible that they're going to be utilizing for the deliveries. Um, a, uh, and, and that's the, to the end consumer delivery. Um, for that, they can only carry up to $3,000 worth of product in the vehicle at any given time. So uh, that would limit the amount of deliveries that they can do and how much product's really held. Mostly that'd be something that could be fit into a trunk safe of some sort um, with the tracking device on the vehicle. Um, for the larger distribution, which would be potentially moving the boxes out to another delivery to fulfill the deliveries, say there was 100 deliveries being done in San Francisco, we wouldn't need those each to be coming out of the facility. They could transfer the 100 boxes to another delivery facility. That would be potentially done in something like a small, you know, or a van um, or, or potentially even like a, a, bo you know, a box van if it's a larger order that's going to um, maybe to Southern California for a distribution. Okay, thank you. And, and maybe I'm... More eloquently put than I am. <laughs> thank you. And, and maybe I'm behind the curve on this, but I, my general understanding was that, that the cash for the banking issue is huge for this industry because of the federal non, non going along with this. Um, so I don't know if the city has a concern about this, but um, how are you going to get around the, it's all got to be cash at this point because you can't we told the we we assured the city that we are going to be have a bank account. We've we've made huge efforts that we we are working with to the credit 
we are working to have bank there's credit um credit unions that do take cannabis businesses right. yeah. um and from a federal state it, from a federal stance it is getting easier um every day it's it's becoming more and more accepted and there are um banks you wanted to add to yeah me? i just wanted to uh, so there are, um, as you guys all know, on a federal level, cannabis is still uh, not regulated. Um, there are several state-based credit unions that are accepting uh, cannabis uh, clients, issuing them bank accounts and merchant processing, as well as there are several brokers in the industry that have personal relationships with banks, whereas the bank may be willing to take the risk on a cannabis client, they do not want to advertise that on their public website. So they're doing it and managing it through exclusive relationships with brokers. Uh, that's also an avenue that we've looked at. So I, you know, from a city point of view, the only, probably the main concern we would have as commissioner or I as a loan commissioner is, you know, how much cash is floating around on, on Valley Drive, you know, drawing the wrong kind of attention. And yeah. so what, are you gonna be handling cash or not handling cash? Our primary goal is to not handle cash, and in our operations plan, uh, you'll see it detailed. Uh, I, I don't recall the amount offhand, but a, a small amount, up to a small amount, will be kept on site uh, uh, at any time. Anything over that must go directly to the bank. So there won't be uh, an excessive amount of cash on site at any time. And, and lastly, not, not, I'll stop hogging the floor. Um, are, are you folks, from your point of view as an applicant, satisfied or, or comfortable that you understand the, the police department requirements and, and the extent of their their ability to, to move or alter those requirements? We understand that we are, um, we are new applicants and we have been working with Brisbane and Brisbane has been extremely kind and understanding to take a risk with the cannabis industry and has been working with with us and you know it, and not a lot of cities have been moving forward so we really appreciate that brisbane is moving forward in this industry um we are a new business we really hope that we are being completely transparent with everything that we're doing and that we are being very straightforward with um and open with our business so we really you know hope that we're paving the way forward for um understanding and and we hope that the police department will do the same for us but we do understand that you know we are a cannabis business and we hope that we can work together on this it all the goals are the same we want safety and the city wants safety so we are hoping to work all together thank you okay uh, i'm going to segue on the the cash issue in that having that on hand um Naturally, you want to keep things secure, but you have a business to run. You don't want to be a bank vault. So that would be my concern as well, um, just in that, especially I don't know if you have the other businesses ultimately who are in there, if they bring their own employees. And although you are fairly innocuous looking with no business signage, it would be easy for someone to say, oh, hey, cash business, because it, it's well-known. It's a well-known fact, and it's to ensure your safety and your business as well as the surrounding businesses. So that would be something maybe I would suggest not keeping so much on hand, on the premises. Absolutely. Just looking at what you cited, I won't even mention, but maybe reducing that a little bit. Um, and in general, businesses that we bring on have to abide by every rule that we put in place. That's good. So they have to have a bank account. They have to have operations in place. So they have to abide by all the security requirements that we've put in place for ourselves and if not more. So I absolutely agree with you. We don't want to be a target. We don't want to be a cash business. We don't think the industry should be a cash business. We want to help the industry move away from that. So that is one of our goals as well as to help the these businesses kind of hopefully help them create a structure where we can build that um, that foundation for them as well okay another item and knowing that the security of your premises is far above my concerns your own concerns are there and you're expressing that really well but I had one just in reading this and maybe it's too many movies what if you have power outages what's your security going to be 
Um, so based on the security, a uh, few security plans that we've had a bunch of assessments, so, um, and our secu- the compliance team can also speak to this, is that they have a three-day um, battery life cycle. Um, they won't go out. Um, and the teams that have done it, they've done, the team that has given us uh, some security assessments do the Oakland Police Station. Um, they're pretty, they're pretty hardcore. Okay. Um, on, on one of your pages regarding robberies, burglaries, security, it says notify the city of San Francisco. Is that just a typo, or why would you be notifying the city of San Francisco and not the city of Brisbane? It would be, it's a, probably a typo. Okay, no problem. I figured it was. But <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> no, I thought maybe there was something we didn't know. No, no, no. Okay. Brisbane. And then um, you have visitors, and the procedures you've named for having them on premises seem fairly stringent. The one thing that's not mentioned is... You talk about them having sign signing in and out, but no mention of maintaining visitor logs. And it only came to mind in terms of if there were issues or problems promulgated by visitors, our Brisbane police would probably love to see those. So are those in fact retained and for how long? Definitely. Um there are visitor logs and um seven years. Okay. Stay requirement. Okay. Very good. That's all I have. Can we circle back? Any other questions from the commissioners? Commissioner? Yeah, I, just <clears throat> just a quick uh, question. So uh, cannabis subscription service, uh, who's your competition? You know, we have not had, there are some box companies of the month, but they do just many samples in a box and they they do a monthly just a monthly box to everyone um they're not personalized uh there's ease which is everyone sees the big billboards um their delivery service there's many different delivery services there's not much out there to help there's a lot of different um resources to education but they don't do sampling um So in our deck, we have um, a few different companies as competitors, but nothing that does a subscription sample service. Um, It's a new industry still, and this is something that we've kind of been working on for a while. Okay. Nothing quite like what we're doing, as far as I found it. And if you have, please let me know. No, no, thanks (laughs) for the the background. It was was more of a curiosity of is this saturated or is this, you know, do you have first mover advantage in a sense and and kind of just thinking about – back to you know commissioner gooding's question around traffic and if this if this if this concept does thrive which you know from a brisbane resident perspective uh you know i hope that all local businesses thrive uh that you know what sort of you know impact would that you know just i'm just trying to delivery is not a new concept okay yeah the box the sample box um subscription the sample box personalization is delivery is definitely not a new one okay all right Okay. Well, thank you. Yeah. Any other questions, commissioners? No. Okay. I have one more. With regard to the hours of operation, since that has been under consideration by the council, realistically, what hours would you be looking for? Ideally, we would want to be able to deliver as late as possible because people come home at different hours Mm -hmm. and work at different hours. So that was one of the reasons why, um, personally, we would be hoping to have later hours because, I mean, we I don't get home until after seven. My kids go to swimming, um, you know, have swim practice. So a lot of people don't. And because we have to deliver to a person in hand, it creates barriers. So with our delivery during the day, it's great. And we don't have to deliver to someone's home. We can deliver to someone wherever they are besides state parks, schools, obviously. Or <laughs> um, And we're not delivering to anyone under the age of 21, just letting everybody know. Um, but it, it, it does allow for more uh, delivery to homes and to, to people who need medicine. I believe the current state regulations stipulate that, uh, I think it's 12. is it 12? I, I think it's, I think it's 12, six, six to 12. 12. So there you go. So the state allows for deliveries to happen, uh, anywhere from six to 12. But again, it's up to the local jurisdiction, uh, to regulate what their businesses can do. Okay. Anyone else from 
your associates like to address the commission from the audience? No? Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much for your time. Seeing no other hands, no one wishing to address, could we have a motion to close the public hearing, please? I move to close the public hearing. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Motion carries. Deliberation phase. So wrapping this up, Commissioner Patel, you want to start? I have no concerns. I'm ready to vote. <laughs> okay. Yep. Commissioner Gooding? I, and I read this too long I got prepared too early I've forgotten what the hours of operation are currently in the applications can somebody remind me 8 a.m. to 7 p.m. so that's one of my concerns exactly but you know I, my sense about handling any application is let's try to anticipate issues or things and just clear them or get them out of the way or you know get a mechanism in place for handling it when it comes up I'm incredibly confident that we're going to get requests to extend those hours for the obvious reason that the applicant honestly said, which is that most people, a lot of folks, don't get home before 7 o'clock. So I, I don't know if we need to have this application. Technically, we probably don't have to do this. The application asks for 7. We either say yay or nay for 7. But let's face it, we're going to be looking at a change request in the foreseeable future. and. Does it make any sense to, to deal with it now or express any, any attitude about that? If so, not, we move on. So I think... Excuse me, can we just have John respond to that? Uh, just a point of clarification. Right now, under the the hours of operation or a, a fixed development standard, the commission doesn't have any discretion to modify those. The code amendment that the, is contemplated will extend those or create some different parameters if they come up with fixed hours again that the applicant is comfortable with and they could operate under those extended hours assuming the council extends it if the council if those hours aren't adequate for example most businesses when that within proximity of residential uh, are required to get a separate use permit if they operate past 10 p.m. so I wouldn't expect that the council action would uh, extend past 10 p.m. but we'll see and that's and, gonna, if, and that's going to occur when that uh, code amendment will be back before you probably later in the summer okay thank you for the clarification Chair. okay Commissioner Patel did you have something I was just gonna say that I was watching that council meeting so mm -hmm. okay that was what was gonna that's what I was gonna say okay Commissioner Sison no I'm ready to vote I think they've answered our questions pretty well so okay commissioner gomez um no no thank you for all the details and i'm good yeah. I, I feel pretty much the same uh presentation was very complete done your homework answered the questions um i'd entertain a motion to approve i make a motion to approve could you please uh name the actual yes, yes, yes. use permit Order. All right, I make a motion to approve uh, use permit UP-9-17. And a second, please. All second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Motion carries unanimously. Thank you very much. Thank you for your time in the presentation. So I'm going to read the um, appeals process anyone may appeal the action of the planning commission on a use permit application to the city council not later than six calendar days following the planning commission's decision an application form and fees required to make a formal appeal contact the city clerk for more information so we're going to move on now items initiated by the staff Oh, we have an old business item. Oh, I'm sorry. We do have an old business. I'm sorry. Yes, we do. We do. We have the adoption of the revised planning commission rules and procedures. Yes, uh, thank you. So, oh. looked very clear. Redlined items in there. Do we have any further questions from commissioners on this? 
I don't see any questions. Okay, we have a motion for approval. I'll move to approve the uh, revised rules uh, as previously presented at the last meeting. And a second, please. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Motion carries unanimously. Now we'll move on to items initiated by staff. Uh, thank you. I think one item we just covered is, you know, something on your work program coming up will be the revised cannabis business regulations related to hours and if there are any other standards the council wants us to look at. I will be bringing that forward to you later this uh, probably summer, I think by the time it comes back. Um, the council did make some changes. The commission, probably before most of you were on board, did make some amendments to the city's regulations related to what are called accessory dwelling units, sometimes known as granny flats, the small units that people are entitled to have with their single family residence. Uh, the council did make some minor changes to um, what the planning commission recommended to them. And they eliminated a minimum lot size requirement in the Brisbane acres for non-conforming parcels. Otherwise, they pretty much adopted it per the council's, or, uh, per the commission's recommendation. Um, and I believe that's it we've talked about. We'll be coming back with a sort of a educational series of kind of workshops for the commission and uh, staff is putting together an, a tentative schedule and uh, probably would be helpful to understand is what some of the council or the commission's summer schedule is going to be like in terms of potential meetings that might be not well attended either meetings we might want to cancel or make sure we don't schedule where people are going to be gone so so we'll be uh soliciting uh some information regarding summer uh scheduling so we understand our, what our meeting schedule will be like this summer and that's all i have okay moving on to items initiated by the commission any commissioners have anything they'd like to bring up i have one uh, since we have quite a few new commissioners, there was a time that the Planning Commission meetings were on Thursdays instead of Tuesdays. And I have a little bit of sense uh, discussed with staff that it's caused a little bit of a burden for them to get the material in order before Tuesday. And they are willing to make whatever effort it takes to meet the Tuesday meetings. but. I'm choosing to bring up amongst the commissioners whether if this becomes an undue burden on them if we would collectively be able to consider moving the meetings back to Thursdays. So it may not work. You you were appointed knowing that meetings were on Tuesdays. That may not fit your schedule, but I'd like to hear just a little feedback and discussion from each of you. So we're not going to lock it in place, but reserve this as a potential. Commissioner Patel? I prefer Thursdays. Okay, Gooding? I'm I'm okay either way. Yeah, Go I would I would prefer Thursday too. Yeah, yeah, I can make either work. Okay, and and I'm fine with Thursdays. So John, how would we proceed on this? Do you want a motion? Do you Well, um <laughs> Or do you want to think about it? No, no, I mean the the maybe we should add this before we did the old business because the the well, maybe we could Because the rules are what set the meeting dates, the rules you just adopted. <laughs> oh, right. So I'm wondering if we could um, unwind the tape and uh, maybe accept a motion <laughs> to uh, to reopen the um, right. the adopted adoption of the rules and procedure. Are we need. Oh, But they made the good point that I should probably check the availability of this right. room. Right. Um, so why don't I bring it back? We can bring it back as a business item with a change to the rules. I do need to confirm its availability and accessibility of oh. this facility. Okay. So additional question would be uh, our agenda already lists the next meeting on a Tuesday. Would you prefer we keep that meeting date? Yes, until we formally okay. change it and we'll start at a, f a fixed effective date because, you know, things, for example, having the city attorney and getting him here for meetings, um, you know, we need to 
pin that down before we make a change. So. Okay, and I just personally would like to thank you and your staff for all the heroics you've you've gone through to try to make those Tuesday meetings happen oh. and have those packets ready. It's really hard. So at this point, I would entertain a motion for adjournment and could you please name the next meeting date for the public sure. watching at home? I'm sure one more thing before we yes. adjourn, we should probably have the record reflect that we're returning the sample box <laughs> to the applicant. Oh yes, <laughs> the, the sample block box <laughs> is being returned to the applicant. But we are not retaining that sample box. <laughs> With, with secure escort. <laughs> so okay, we I, I move to adjourn the meeting to until our next regular meeting of May 8th, 2018 at 7.30 p.m. And a second? I'll second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you very much. Good night.